Hello. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Beyond the Pink Cloud. This is your host, Dr. Alice Kirby. With me today, I have Dr. Matt Jeffs. He is a physical therapist, a strong proponent of Tai Chi, and was actually the person who taught a continuing education course I did through Summit a few weeks ago. And I went right up and talked to him after the course because I loved so much what he was teaching. And um, it just really opened my mind up to how a lot of the work that I do with neuroscience can be incorporated and brought into the realm of physical therapy, which for me was a wonderful moment of sort of professional and personal interests of worlds colliding. So thank you. Thanks for being here, Matt. Oh, gosh. Thank you. I, I was honored when you came up afterwards. Uh, in just a few words we shared, I was like, ah, this lady gets it. You know, it's, <laughs> there's a, a certain amount of us who are hearing this stuff for the first time on the tours around the U.S., but after every one, there's about 10% who come up and, golly, we end up talking sometimes for hours, but it's, it's exciting because... Um, when I re meet someone like you and the ex exceptional work you're doing, it thrills me too because it re I realize, okay, this is a movement that's gaining momentum and there are leaders out there like you doing it. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, the feeling is mutual. Thanks so much that's for coming great. on. So great. maybe maybe you can tell us a little bit about... Um, about your own background. I'm really curious if you could talk more how Tai Chi came into your role. I know you've been practicing as a physical therapist for quite a long time. Um, so maybe just give us a, a, a reasonable summary of your history and, and what's brought you to the work you do now, or you can focus more on the where your passion is these days and the work that you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll make it a brief summary, but um, when I was 17, uh, I was a little bit of an at-risk youth and uh, troubled, a troubled young 17-year-old, and um, learned about transcendental meditation. So this was back in 1977, and uh, it was great. I found a nearby school and paid for it, and it was wonderful. I wasn't, you know, as a 17 young person, I wasn't that much of an adherent. I did it for maybe about a year and a half. I saw a benefit, but I didn't feel it translate much into the rest of my life. I'm sure it did, mm. but uh, fast forward um, 30, 40, 30 or so years, and over those years, I kind of rediscovered mind-body medicine in the mid late 90s through uh dr andrew wild the mm -hmm. uh bald-headed guy with a white beard looks like a garden gnome and i mean that lovingly <laughs> i love dr Weil. i love him and he had a lot of um you know through his uh introducing inter integrative medicine which is now taught at all the top medical schools 65 of the top medical schools around the u.s um he had a series of CDs, two CD sets, with all of these interesting practices. There was a meditation one with John Kabat-Zinn. There was a uh, guided imagery one with, um, oh, I forget the other doctor's name. There was a um, self-hypnosis one. Hmm. And each of these two DV, uh, CD sets, which are still at a lot of libraries for free right now, the first CD would be about the history and science, and the second CD would be about the pra practice. So I would practice these and explore these venues. Then I, I, um, I wanted to get more into the mind-body approaches. Those were wonderful, by the way, uh, the ones that I just mentioned. But I wanted to get into the mind-body because that's what you and I do. you mm -hmm. know. And, and I knew there was a pathway there because for decades, uh, yoga had evolved in our culture and you know i remember back when it was something um rare and a little off kilter you know it was only us weirdos that would do that sort of thing and then it became more mainstream and that's a good thing because that means accessibility um and i i did yoga you know i have i have a saying i love yoga but it doesn't love me back and i just <laughs> I've injured myself a few times in yoga classes over the years. And it's just like, doggone it. Just when I get to like 
-hmm. a threshold of flexibility and movement, something in my, it's often an SI joint or a lower, Mm -hmm. you know, but something goes Mm -hmm. out and then I'm like, crap, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm snake bit here. Well, um, what, uh, about maybe 10, 15 years ago, now bring us up to where we are today. Forgive me, I ramble. No, you're but, fine. It's a very concise summary. And I relate completely about yoga. I, since I had a, a kind of an unknown back injury a few years ago, I just can't, I can't do those forward folds anymore. Yeah, too much yeah, neurotension. Yeah, Doesn't something work. goes on and something goes out and then it's just like, and it's heartbreaking because it is. I've, made, I've made progress. And then all of a sudden I, I reach this threshold and something shifts and it's like, okay, I'm in, I'm unstable mm-hmm. in my left SI joint. And so, and now I'm like on my back for the next week on ice packs. So anyway, um, about 10, 15 years ago, I was in a Barnes and Noble and there was a rack of DVDs and the uh, company is called Diam. You know, they do those, all those kind mm-hmm. of fitness. And so there were all these yoga DVDs and I'm spinning the rack going, Oh, look at this. And one goes by that says Tai Chi. And I'm like, stop, you know, I stopped the rack and went back and, and it was like AMT for beginners. And I was just like, Oh, this is perfect. So I bought it and on it was this guy named David Dorian Ross, which I'll, whom I'll get to later. But Mm -hmm. I'm uh, curious, just, sorry, I want to interrupt you just for a moment because that sounds like such a profound moment when you see this Tai Chi DVD, like what do you, when you think about that, what do you notice happens in your body? Like what, what's that, that sense of that stop? Cause that looks like a big, like a, like a really a felt sense. Yeah, that's a good, thank you. You you're very perceptive to, you're right. Something just went ding like that. So interesting uh, when that happens. Yeah. It was like a body reaction. And Mm. all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I mean, I think that was something that I always wanted, you know, I always admired. I grew up in as a little kid in the sixties and then a teenager in the seventies, as I described. And so as us little kid in the sixties, we were first exposed to um, Bruce Lee as Cato in a children's program called the Green Hornet. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as little kids, we first saw this stuff and we we're like, wow. And then he, you know, there was a show called Kung Fu with David Carradine and et cetera. Then the Karate Kid in the seventies. But, uh, I never had the, um, like I said, it was kind of an at-risk youth and I never had the, um, uh, personal maturity to to uh, to dedicate to that sort of thing because that's martial art that's mm-hmm. tough stuff. So I saw this and something just rang and it was like all these confluences came together. The beauty of the DVD was I took it home and you know I almost hope that technology doesn't go away. I know we're, everything's going to streaming, but there was one benefit of the DVD you could slow it all the way down to stop motion. And then you could advance the speed incrementally, which meant a lot of these Tai Chi moves are a little complex. Very complex, some of them. Yeah, when you're learning them, you kind of want to just go click, click, Hmm. click. You could really slow it down and then play along with it and then slowly advance the speed until you're doing it full speed. So I started practicing that. And as I've shared before, Remember I said the kid, the 17-year-old in Transcendental Meditation, it was wonderful while he did the Transcendental Meditation, but he didn't really notice it translating into his life. Well, the difference between the Tai Chi was I began to notice the days I didn't do it. That's what Mm. resonated. Well, you know, just like you're saying, this body sense was – the days, the mornings that I skipped it, and I ended up doing that DVD for like a couple of few years, every morning, get up 20 minutes, 30 minutes earlier, the house is dark, you know, everything's quiet, and turn that on, it had beautiful background music, Asian background music, and David Dorian Ross is this really sweet guy, and he just leads you through it, and what I noticed was, I didn't notice until the days I skipped it, and the days I skipped it, I I noticed this irritated, agitated, aggravated state came back. And I realized like a year or two later, crap, that was my default state. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that until I've been doing these things. I've been calmer most days. So then I really started to pay attention and I'm like, okay, 
let me really pay attention to this. And then I noticed I'd go into work and I would just be like, I, I describe it to people like this because it's very, um, it is very Eastern and yin yang. And, and that is when life's assaults would come at me, they'd glance off when I was doing my Tai Chi in the morning. The mm. days that I skip, they'd find purchase. They'd hit me right in the chest and knock me back. And then I'd be, you know, fight or flight. It was like, wow, this whole yin yang thing is actually a lifestyle. And that's kind of brought us to today. That's beautiful. I love the way that you described that. And for those of you that are just listening, Matt's doing some really beautiful movements with his body to describe that of, of like the incoming assault. He's sort of shifting one shoulder back as a, like very Aikido style to kind of deflect the movement and have it not get in versus having it come straight into the chest. And I think so many of us can relate to that on, there are those days where we can, things can happen, but we're able just to roll through them so much more easily and, and with less reactivity. So that's beautiful. Tai Chi was helpful to you in that way. I mean, that's, I think, the, the point, really. Yeah, thank you. That's the, uh, that was my takeaway. And if you remember in our class, I talk about as beautiful, beautiful as the sitting meditation traditions are, and they're gorgeous, breath work, meditation, uh, guided imagery, self-hypnosis, all of them, um, are they a good fit? for our particular age, you know, our modern age. And um, I would argue they're not as, not as good as they once were. You used to lead a very physical life where you chopped wood, carried water, tended garden, hunted game. When you got home, you earned the right to sit in a lotus position in front of a guttering fire or a flickering candle and focus on your breath. And it made total sense. We now live in a lifestyle that we're sitting too much and we've got too much information rattling through that's always keeping us a little irritated, agitated, and aggravated. And I, I would argue uh, that moving meditation makes more sense at this time. So that's where you and I come in. People who have the physical therapy background and the mind-body background, all your experience in massage therapy, that's really when we start to realize, wait a minute, we've got a point of entry here. We're not mm -hmm. taking advantage of. So we really should uh, uh, focus on this more and use this as a point of entry to help people. Again, that kid, you know, he got benefit from transcendental meditation back in 1977 when he was 17 years old. But that man who practiced Tai Chi, it translated off out into his world and that to me is like that's what we're looking for that's exactly what we're looking for i don't think i mean we do these practices to feel better in the moment but ideally we're doing them to feel better in multiple moments and throughout our days and throughout our lives yes so that's wonderful and i agree completely about the moving meditation i've talked about qigong often yes. and frequently as a moving meditation and how important that is. I work with a lot of the older adult population and particularly for them, these movements are so nice and gentle and they're wonderful for pumping fluid through the joints as well as increasing strength and creating that more sense of a parasympathetic uh, arousal, I guess, or settling. Yes. Um, yes. So I love the work and I'm curious too how you were able to bring some of the Tai Chi practices into your work as a physical therapist. Uh, I know there is a lot of evidence around it. When I was in school, I actually did a lot of, a lot of papers and presentations on Tai Chi and Qigong to sort of, you know, drag the, the, the mindset of the people that I was surrounded with this way of like, Hey, this isn't something that's weird. It's, right. it's very evidence-based. So I'm curious what that was like for you to start using this with your patients, um, particularly for any PTs that are listening that are interested and maybe aren't quite sure how to, make that transition or to start bringing this work into what they're doing with their patients currently. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you know, it, it all started with a uh, colleague of ours, I should shout out to John Carzoli. He's a DPT who is a associate um, program chair and a professor up here in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina at Western Carolina University, which is part of University of North Carolina's system. So it's part of the state system and they have a DPT program. And uh, some years back, he um, asked me, he saw me actually speak at a 
North Carolina PTA um, conference, an annual conference. And afterwards he said, do you think you could come speak to our students? And I said, of course, I'd love to. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing it ever since. So he saw the opportunity early. And, and what we've done every year ever since was um, my teacher, uh, David Dorian Ross, the guy who was on that DVD, I later, I later met him and we've, we've worked together ever since. And um, we, I, it's usually like an annual three hour lecture or three hour uh, period. These are outgoing seniors. So they're on their final um, semester before they go on their final clinicals. So it's like an 8,000, 9,000 level class. And he brings me in like just weeks before the end of their semester. And I do about two hours of lecture of which you got when we met uh, mm -hmm. in San Diego. And uh, those are the two meatiest hours that we went through. That's what they get. They get those two meaty hours. And then we uh, beam teleconference in David Dorian Ross from your neck of the woods. He's in Huntington Beach, California. Okay. And we... Yeah, we do this live um, uh, simulcast where he leads the whole class. Then we sit down and he does a live question and answer for us. And the reason why is not only to introduce them to not mind body medicine. This is the genius of John Carzoli. He's also introducing his graduating seniors to telehealth. Because again, you know, I, I often say, Alice, you know, if 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 I can teach somebody um, parting the wild horse's mane via telehealth, uh, you we, you and I both can teach someone quad sets. You know what I mean? It's, Definitely. It's really, we get that sort of mindset. Oh no, no, I need to be in the same room with them. Yeah, right. for some things, yeah. I have to put my hands on them, but we yeah, we don't yeah. need to with every person. For some people, Not, honestly, I think the telehealth is better, especially if there's trauma involved, because it's more of a sense of safety for people to be in their own environment and not have accessory noise or lights or unfamiliar other people around them. I think there's a calming with that that's actually beneficial for many people. I never thought about that, but you're absolutely right. I never considered that, but that's totally uh, in line with this. God, that's really a great perspective. You know, yeah, I mean, we, we're really, our value really is up here. That's the difference between a professional and a technician. And I don't mean to put any technicians down, but um, a technician is paid for what they do. A professional is paid for what they know. And mm. uh, we're a little of both, but you know, when we're, when we're reduced to checking CPT codes, that's what the fellas that, you know, work on our cars do when they ch changed our oil and they flushed our radiator and all of that, not to put that down. That's important stuff. But let's make sure we understand the difference between the two. And there's an awful lot we do up here. That's really where we put it together. And, you know, when we work alongside um, PTs who I think every PT and OT and PTA and CODA and ATC should all like do a stint of home health because that's where you get out of this artificial clinical environment and you get into you get out of your comfort zone where you're the master of all you survey and you become the it it changes the dynamic and you walk into somebody's house and then you go okay let's get creative i notice you have that staircase over there that would be perfect to be able to do i'll teach you how to do planks on the stairs before mm -hmm. you get to the floor and and in the same thing you you know i i've done a lot of industrial where i've worked in industrial big dirty dangerous settings and i can tell you what it does for your ego is it just shrinks it down into this little thing where it's sort of like <laughs> okay, I'm not important here. And that's really good for you. It's you know? great. It's still, you know, and you walk up to people humbly and it's like, listen, I've got to do a physical demand analysis on your job. You know, we can talk about that another time, but I, I, I'll go off on rabbit uh, chases if I don't uh, bring it back. But um, yeah, um, uh, as far as the Tai Chi and all of that goes, uh, I realized that we had a um, modality here. 
if if you'll allow me, I'll keep chattering. Oh, Stop please do. Me. No, no, okay. it's great. I've got. I I do have one other thing I want to ask you about. But Excellent. no, I I I love hearing about this, and I think. Okay. All right. I think what you were talking about bring it into to telehealth too, and I think Tai Chi is such a nice. I do a lot of videos in my Facebook group of just one or two qigong exercises. We do a meditation every Monday and sometimes I'll do some chanting and sometimes it's breath work and sometimes it's qigong, but I love the um it's the the video platform works wonderfully with it. It does. It does. And and that's thank you for bringing me back cuz like I say I go off on rabbit. Holes, <laughs> we all so do. Rabbit chases. But um but John wanted on top of the tai chi and the qigong he wanted those students to be introduced to telehealth platforms because these are our graduating colleagues and they're getting this in school now they recognize that's coming and that's going to be the way they practice or you know partially it's not going to be all or nothing it's going to be hybrids just mm -hmm. as you just described now you were asking me about the uh, i believe a little bit about the overlap and so that course that I was doing year in and year out at the Western Carolina, I wanted to do with for our colleagues. So um, in North Carolina, they have these things called AHECs, they're Area Health Education Centers. They're federally, state, and municipally funded. It's wonderful. Where, yeah, and so doctors go for continuing ed there, nurses go for continuing ed there, uh, allied health do as well. And to teach there, you've got to have a really high standard. You've got to pass through some hoops. So I took that course that I did at, the, at Western Carolina and another university called High Point University. And, and I, um, I said, I, it's proof of concept now time. I've got to, you know what, or get off the pot. So I presented it to a contact at one of the local AHEX and we ended up doing it and we ended up having about 30 physical and occupational therapists. We did the same thing. I did about seven hours of lecture and one hour of teleconference with David Dorian Ross. We're in Asheville, North Carolina. This was at the Mountain Area Health and Education Center in Asheville, North Carolina, about a half hour from where I am right now. And um, David Dorian Ross did an hour from Huntington Beach again. So everybody got introduced to that, and I'm like, see, it was successful. And then I pitched the, the same idea to Summit, and they sent me around the country on that. That's how it evolved. But what I learned in the process, you were asking about the overlap, mm -hmm. was um, as I was preparing the course for Asheville, I, I wish I could remember the moment, other than it was one of those eureka aha moments where... Um, I was able to recognize in my old training days from University of Florida, my first clinical degree was a bachelor's at University of Florida in the late 80s, early 90s. Then I got my doctorate at Chatham University years later. But back in the Florida days, we were immersed a lot in neuroscience. That, that program was heavily influenced. Our, our director was a... Um, Marty Clendenin, and she was a neuroscientist and a PT. So that's wonderful. They used to call, yeah, they called ortho. It was funny. They were kind of snobby about it, but I'm glad yeah. they were. Yeah, they, used to, they used to call ortho nuts and bolts. They were like, you learn that stuff on yourself. That's the easy stuff. Now come on in and we're going to show you neuro. So one of the heavy duty neuro influences they gave us back then was of course PNF, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And, and what David Dorian Ross did was give us accessibility mm. with Tai Chi and Qigong. Well, all of a sudden those two worlds collided on me and all of a sudden I just realized, wait a minute. And I ran downstairs. I'm here to tell you right now, Alice, down in my lower floor is a bookshelf still with... <laughs> I shouldn't admit this, but they, I still have my textbooks from PT school. <laughs> yeah, they're hard to get rid of. Well, I, well, you can't you can't give them away. So it's sort of like, well, what the heck? Well, I have my PNF textbook. Do I all of a sudden I'm up here on the third floor and I like run down there and I start flipping open pages and I start finding all this vernacular that pertains to what we do in the clinic, all of this kinesiology vernacular you know, bilateral symmetrical, bilateral asymmetrical, bilateral reciprocal, hands follow, eyes follow hands, hands follow eyes. And it just was like, 
boom, suddenly east meets west. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we can overlap these two. Because frankly, um, you know, if you on your paperwork, if you are keeping notes, and especially if you're submitting to third party, you know, if you put uh, white crane spreads wings on your paperwork, <laughs> you know, good, good luck getting reimbursed for that. But, but you could put white crane spreads wings, but underneath, if you say that's a bilateral asymmetrical movement, da da mm-hmm. da, suddenly it's like, oh, okay, she's speaking Western now. Right. And, and that's when those two collided. And that's when I realized, oh, crap, we're onto something here because we, you know, we can actually convey this. Now we have a common language between the two worlds. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I like that you said that because I will put sharing sea with sky in my notes. <laughs> but then I'll elaborate on what that is. But it gives me a yeah. little thrill to write it down. I don't know why. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Feels and, a little and, rebellious, maybe. That's that's what I've I recognized in you right away. That's the word right there was rebellious. I'm like <laughs> Kindred spirit, because, you know, we, we finally get our turn at that. Yes. And, it's know, very refreshing. I, it is. It is refreshing. And, you know, if I can, just a little bit about David Dorian. So I, I lovingly describe him to my audiences around the country as Miles Davis of martial arts. And what I mean by that is, you know, back in the days of early uh, yoga being adopted, you would go to a course you would feel phenomenal after the course. So you'd tell the first friend you met, I took a yoga course class. I felt wonderful afterwards. And back in the day, maybe the seventies or so, maybe even this, well, if it was around, yeah, in the West, probably sixties and seventies, someone would ask you if they hadn't heard of it, they would ask you, they'd be a traditionalist and they would ask you what kind, was it Hatha, was it Kundalini? Mm -hmm. Was it Kripalu? Was it Ashtanga? What were you doing? And you'd be like, oh, geez, I don't know. It was yoga and it was wonderful. Well, like I say, eventually it got adopted and westernized. And now we have goat yoga. (laughs) (laughs) Which is really fun. Well, I haven't done goat yoga, but I have had goats kind of jump on my back at my sister's farm. And it's, it is sort of yogic. It's really cute. Baby goats are really cute. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I, you know, it, Goat I, yoga. <laughs> we're, we're pushing boundaries and that's okay, you know, because that's where we find the, the boundaries. So, you know, there's beer yoga and stuff like that. It's all gorgeous. But the point being was um, just 10 or 15 years ago, if you told somebody you took some or you're studying some Tai Chi, you get the same question. A traditionalist would say, well, what was it? Was it Chen style? Was it Wu style? Yang style? Uh, uh, Sun style, which one? Same type of traditionalist question. And so um, what David Dorian did, and if you look him up, he's like sold more DVDs than anyone on the planet. He, he, and I'm, this isn't a commercial for him. I just, mm-hmm. I, this is who I learned from. So he learned the traditional styles back in um, San Francisco's Chinatown back in the seventies. And it was very rigorous then he opened a school in Hawaii and was featured a lot on Hawaii public television back then. Oh, that's neat. And then, yeah. And, and then um, he uh, became a competitor with it. And I think even in the fighting forms back when nobody knew what it was. So he actually had a competitive advantage. Everybody was uh, Taekwondo back there. So it was punches and kicks. And if somebody knew yin energy mm-hmm. and could draw you in, then they could use your energy against you. And that's the brilliance of yin and yang is like there's sometimes to push and there's sometimes to yield. And learning the yield side is a whole new set of principles and and tools for your quiver, you know, arrows for your quiver. So um, where I'm going with all this is... Uh, When I met him back in 2013 in not far from my house, a couple of uh, hours from my house in New Smyrna Beach, he was doing, he just rolled out Taiji Fit. And as he explained it, he got tired of starting with 20 students and winding up with two. And the rigorous martial arts are that way. Mm -hmm. But he said he wanted to give everybody, he was inspired by Mihai Csikszent Mihai's book, Flow. Um, very famous book on the flow state. 
And he realized he had this tool to teach people the flow state. But if you go from 20 down to two, there's 18 people who never got a chance to taste that. So he wanted to come up with something accessible. That's where you and I come in. So he came up with Taiji Fit and he said, you know what? I'm going to come up with something where people can learn the groove first. I'm, we're not here to teach them the martial art. We're here to teach them ways to hack the flow state. Mm. So what, he, what, you know, and so the whole Miles Davis with martial arts thing that I tell people is when you hear Chen style, Wu style, Yang style, Sun style, you're, 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 it's just like, Haydn, Brahms, Schubert, Mozart, that's like classical music. If you go to one of those symphonies tonight, you're going to hear the symphony the way it was written hundreds of years ago. And that's note for note, measure for measure. And that's beautiful. Classical music is beautiful. Classical Tai Chi and Chai Chi Gong is beautiful. But what David Dorian Ross did was come up with ads. And that's why I call him the Miles Davis of martial arts is we can learn these little movements and these little measures and these notes, and then we can create new art each time. We can come up with different ways of applying it, which means we can fall into a groove together. We can, cut. I like to do it like this. It's like tasting flow state and going, mm, that's delicious, you know? And mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, isn't that cool? And it's more accessible than you realize. So it's this way of hacking what used to be the thing that was only available to the top athletes, the top musicians, the top artists. Um, isn't that beautiful? It is. And I, I think it's so important to think about even bringing this, if anyone's listening to this and thinking about trying to bring this work into their lives or with their families or with their patients or into their clinics, the idea that it doesn't have to be done perfectly or it doesn't have to be done you know, exactly the way that it's always been done, that we do have a little wiggle room. I think that as professionals, that can take some of the edge off and some of the pressure off for us too. Of like, right. hey, maybe what we're doing isn't, isn't to execute perfectly every Tai Chi movement that ever existed, but it's to introduce a sense of this flow state to our patients or, or to our and, families. Yes, yes. And it's like, it's like repositioning the funnel as well, because don't you know he gets people who, and, and I tell that in my classes, I teach this at a hospital-owned fitness center hmm. um, here in Western North Carolina. I have for two years. It's been my, uh, it's kind of been my laboratory and my playground. And I tell, I usually have a good 10, 15, 20 students every class. And I, and I openly, jo we joke and I tell them, you know, you're my lab rats. We're going to try some th new things together. I usually do one class that's, uh, that we've always done. You got a taste of it when we did it in, North, in uh, San Diego. And then I do more of an experimental class. And I tell the class that we're, you know, this, this stuff isn't really worked out yet. So if my commands are, you know, and I, I hate to use the word commands, but you get the idea. My leads mm -hmm. are a little, you know, not rounded yet. Don't worry. We're working through this. We're trying this. Um, that's that's the beauty of the access and then circling back to what you and I do as a living and you know some of us who are listening and viewing who are PTs and OTs you realize and this is where our angle came in and this is where I kind of met up with him and I said dude do you realize by giving us this freedom from the classical music Mm -hmm. we're like really good at breaking these things down from simple to complex. That's Absolutely. What we do. Yeah, it's true. What we do so. And that's where the two worlds of P and F came together as well, because you know, in P and F, there are bilateral symmetrical moves. There's, you know, you can do D one D two and all that stuff. Well, Holy mackerel, there's a whole category of Tai Chi moves that are bilateral symmetrical, sink the chi, gather the chi, uh, cleanse the lungs. And I'm like, wow, so I could take somebody from their very first visit and show them the easiest stuff. And then as I progress them through their rehabilitation, we can go to more complex movements where we're reciprocal and we're doing all these asymmetrical movements. And that's when all this, it really, getting back to your original question, it was that course in Asheville 
where the you know what hits the fan where suddenly mm -hmm. it's sort of like okay you've got to produce now you've got a deadline this course they expect this that all of that came together and I realized wow we've actually got the vernacular we've actually got the training we've actually got this access point to be able to you know sitting meditation is tough for a certain amount of the population so let's not even call it that let's just get up and move and let's get our breathing going with our movement and lo and behold we're tipping the scale of the autonomic nervous system and you and i don't know why actually we know why but you may not know why but you're actually starting to feel calmer your pain is starting to reduce you're starting to realize that in life the stuff that used to find purchase in your chest is mm -hmm. now glancing off of your shoulder. And Alice, that's powerful stuff. It's a great way to go through life. I think it also gives you a, a sense of ownership over your own body that is sometimes really difficult to, for people to have, either if they've sustained you know, serious trauma or if they have been in this substance abuse world for a long time. Yeah. where there just isn't this presence or even people with chronic pain. Um, yes. And I think starting to do these movements that are slow and controlled and that trigger the autonomic nervous system and, and a little bit of an unwind and a settle, it starts to bring us like from the inside out a little bit so that we can take ownership of our bodies and then go through life that way, which is, I mean, you know, why wouldn't we want to do that? It's, it's so beautiful. And, and I want to say one more thing while we're on this topic too, something you just said about, the sitting meditation, which I definitely agree with. And I remember when I was really early in sobriety, a big thing that some of the 12 step sort of vernacular will tell you is you've got to like wake up and, and like pray on your knees and, and sit. And when I first got sober, I was having this back flare up that I mentioned earlier. And there was no way I was sitting on my knees or there wasn't any of that. I needed to get up and walk. And so I got into this habit. I live by these really nice cliffs by the ocean. So I got up in this habit where I would get up and you know, walk up to this one spot. And I still do this many days and I would do some Qigong and I would do some gentle stretching and I would do some gratitude and say some of these yeah. prayers that I found helpful. And, and I realized like, okay, this isn't, there isn't one way to do this. And so I talk about that a lot to my audience too, because sometimes getting up and just sitting isn't, I mean, that's not the best thing for everybody. So just to realize there's other ways we can do something similar and have a similar effect on our nervous system of really what we're trying to get at, which is being calm, being in our body. Um, just to point out, there are these wonderful alternatives that feel so good to do. I agree. And, and I've, I've followed you online too, and, and you do bring a sophistication level that's very encouraging and, and, and supportive. I, I, you know, getting back to this, and I'm, thank you for pointing it out. Cause I, I don't even realize what I do visually sometimes, but, but that, that purchase that hits you in the chest and that's the only way i can describe it comes from and again this has this this vague martial arts aspect to it is you know it's when you come at something perpendicularly sometimes that's not the best approach sometimes an oblique approach mm. is much more gentle so to your point, it's sort of like get on your knees or sit in the lotus position and all like that. And you've got to start here because that's the way we've always done it. Right. It, maybe not. Maybe yeah, not. Maybe, maybe not. That walk, yeah. Maybe that walk in the woods or, or like you say, that walk up to that favorite spot. I have a favorite spot here that I go to and um, because there's a spiritual aspect to it. And you know, the surroundings can be as valuable or anything. It just, it flips a little switch and it does so in, a, in an oblique way. You know, there's, there's a, a sophistication to it. And, and sometimes we, uh, we have to have more of these therapeutic arrows in our quiver and try, you know, it's like I always say, we're in a, a, a a beautiful enlightened 21st century now. I'm really excited because some of us have been taking one for the team for decades. <laughs> and, <laughs> I know. And, Thank and you. Really, Thanks for paving been, the way. We've been taking the ridicule. We've been taking the ridicule and it's finally now the neuroscience and all the science is, is catching up with this. And we have to recognize that everything is multivariate but not only is it multivariate, it's combinatorial. So different things can add up and then be forced multipliers. And lastly, 
they can integrate. And what we need to be able to do is realize our approach is the same way. We can take multivariate approaches like you're describing, and as I see you do with your audience, and realize, well, you know, you can, com you can combine these in different ways and find the different combinations that are force multipliers. And that's, that's tuning it, that's customizing it to you. Mm -hmm. So exploring all of these options, I often say, you know, over this life, it's been meditation, guided imagery, self-hypnosis, Tai Chi, Qigong, y y yoga. Um, I'm, not a ma I'm not a master of any trade and I'm a, j a jack of all trades. But what I have learned in these experiences, they all seem to be the same, different paths to the same door. Mm -hmm. So people learning their path and learning, wow, you know what, when I combine what Dr. Alice Kirby told me with these daily walks in the woods, all I know is I seem to be managing life better. I'm not irritated, agitated, aggravated anymore, which leads me to these un unhealthy behaviors I used to do to manage that. And mm -hmm. It's just fascinating. It's really a, a tremendous time to be um, practicing and uh, exploring all of us together. It is. I love, I love what you just said about co like doing these different combinations, because I feel like this is something I'm, I'm working with in a lot of areas. I'm in my second year of training with this somatic experiencing work. So I'm an intermediate student. So I, I, I have some tools. I know things. I practice with people. I see, I see clients with this. And so working with bringing that into kind of the, the sober population that I work with and, and speaking that language and then also bringing it into my physical therapy population and that's a little bit different and how does it look? And part of my brain very much wants to have it all pinned down. So I know what I'm doing. I know exactly how to explain it. And, uh, and you know, I just don't. It's a lot of experimental. It's a lot of experimenting. It's a lot of me talking to people, sometimes stumbling through what I'm talking about. And I think that's, that's all just part of figuring out like what is the right combination you know, for this person or for this, that person. And it's, it might always be just a little bit different, but like you said, to have this really nice quiver to pull yeah. from and be like, Oh, this movement is working really well for you, but maybe not for you. And in particular with patients that might have, I, I have a few Parkinson's patients I'm working with right now. And some of those, some of those Tai Chi movements are really hard for them. Um, for, I'm thinking for one person in particular, but then some of the other ones just click and they work so well for him. And he's, he reports like, Oh, this just feels really good. Um, yeah. So to be able to discern and create and, and be experimental and to, again, take some of that pressure off. I think I probably put a lot of pressure on myself. So I love well, when, when there's these, this, this thought of like, we can be creative with this and that's okay. And it's, it's wonderful and what we should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I can tell, uh, again, just from watching the work you do on social media and all that, uh, when you, when you build that level of trust between you and whomever you're working with one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that's when the magic happens. That's mm -hmm. when you're like, Hey, listen, you know, this can be a, I lecture, you listen relationship, or this could be a collaborative one. And if you're into the collaborative one, we got a whole lot of fun stuff we can play with. Now, mm -hmm. some is going to be hit and misses, but if you're willing to go on this journey with me, I've got this whole, again, that quiver of arrows. We can play with, we can play archery and yeah. we can try these different things. And um, I think when there's that collaborative spirit, that's when we really have the most to work with. I think so too. It, it really gives people a, a sense of ownership over their own healing too which a lot of yes. people need, again, that embodiment of, no, this is my journey and, and I take part in it. Someone's not just telling me what to do. Yeah. I think that's yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. No, I read a lot of uh, sophistication into the work you do and I can tell Thank that. Um, no, very, it's very sophisticated. Hey, uh, kin well, kindred spirit is, is all it's, this isn't to like pump us up. It's just to say that, you know, I call it metaphysical therapy and I call that deliberately metaphysical therapy because again i practice the way we practiced i practiced the way we practiced back in the 1980s and i'm here to tell you we're not animated robots we're not meat puppets we're complex organisms very complex organisms and when 
I discovered Andrew Weil back reading uh, Spontaneous Healing and then followed his source back to George Engel and the biopsychosocial model of the late 1970s. I was just like, aha, hmm. this, this is making much more sense now because you, you know, when we practiced back in that 80s way, much of what we confronted was a physical manifestation of something else, you yeah. know, the, the stress, by the time, unrest. Yeah. Yeah. By the time something physically manifests, we're late in the game. And when you start and look at the biopsychosocial influences, I often use the example uh, and I say it to my shame. I, I, that's part of the ownership is I remember back practicing in the 90s and early 2000s and rolling my eyes and shaking my head at diagnoses like fibromyalgia. And shame on me because later I realized, you know what, I just wasn't sophisticated enough to help somebody mm. with that condition. That everything points to, you know, these physical po uh, uh, realities are there, but as the point of origin, you have more approaches now. So if you get that person breathing, you get that person breathing with movement. If you advance that breathing and movement, and then like we're talking about, you ask them to find that park that mm -hmm. is a, you know, a special place for them to go. And you start adding these multivariate combinatorial elements. I'm not saying we're curing anything, but by golly, we can give them some control of their situation. Absolutely. And I think for people that have those sort of not very specific diagnoses or diagnoses of exclusion like fibromyalgia, there is this sense of hopelessness that can come with it. And this, I'm living with this pain and there's, you know, maybe they've tried diet or they've tried PT and nothing's working. I'll hear that from people. So I think to introduce some of these different ideas as well as give yeah. them that sense of control, it's, it's a huge yeah. gift for people. And maybe it's not curing or, or healing them or anything like that, but it is, I, giving them an avenue, you know, within, within which they can start to feel better. And that's huge. Well, yes. And it's combinatorial again. And it's, and again, what we're talking about is customizability of just mm -hmm. saying, listen, just because you have the same sounding diagnoses as these other people doesn't mean you're the same person. And it might be a combination of diet and activity and stress management. And I'm here to help you with that. If we can be collaborative I'm here to help you with that. And we will, we'll try some of these different combinations and find that maybe you don't have to rely, because again, a biomedicine has run its course. All it offers you is operate or Medicaid. Those two operate, you know, those two, that's all it funnels down to ultimately. And we're realizing in, in integrative medicine, wait a minute, there's a whole lot more Mm -hmm. We could be trying before we wind up with stuck with those two options. So all we're doing is offering options here, but also realizing, as you're pointing out, that sometimes it's like, well, I, I tried diet. It didn't do anything. I tried exercise. It didn't do anything. I try. Well, have we tried the combinatorial effects, right? The life, the lifestyle medicine effects, the integrative effects. That's what integrative means is that, combinatorial elements can sometimes be force multipliers on one another's. And Absolutely. if you'll collaborate, with, we can work together. We'll explore these things together. Realize we'll, we'll, we might make a wrong turn every now and then you come back and you're more flared up. Okay. We'll make, check that box. We mm -hmm. know now, but we, we don't give up the March. We, we keep, uh, you know, and I remember when I worked um, as the onsite physical therapist at a, big, dirty, dangerous paper plant with 1,300 employees. And I was there 12,000 hours, six years. It was six of the best years of my career. And the reason why was because I encountered people earlier in the game. Mm, before I they had to come I, to a clinic or something like that. They were on the job. Right, okay. Right. And so I, we would sometimes have people come in because they'd They've been off of their blood pressure meds because their blood pressure meds had all these awful side effects. And they'd come in spiking this high blood pressure. And we'd get them into the office and we'd sit down and we'd do breath work. I'd do a guided breath work uh, with them for about 20 minutes. We would drop their 
uh, systolic and um, more the systolic than the diastolic, but we would drop them 30, 40 points. We would have a blood pressure cuff on the whole time, do before and after, show them. And then they'd be like, wow, just from controlling my breath. Yeah. Now understand what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying give up your blood pressure meds. I'm saying practice this, realize you can gain control of it, realize you can influence it. And if you do it more, it is cumulative. You may get to a point where you don't need as high a dose. Mm -hmm. You can have a, if you have a good integrative practitioner, you can work with like your doctor and say, doc, you know, the 15 milligrams is giving me all kinds of side effects. That is just, it's, that's why I don't take them. Mm -hmm. is because of all of the side effects. But if you through breath work and some combinatorial approach now only need seven and a half milligrams of this medication, that's what goes down to the side effects. Then compliance may improve and now you've got skin in the game. You know that when you practice your breath work, when you practice your yoga, your Tai Chi, your Qigong, you don't have to take as strong a dose of that allopathic approach. So to me, I really, having grown up and as you know, you've heard me say the dark ages of the 20th century, um, I really reject whenever I hear it binary thinking. So when I hear either or, yeah. I, I say stop right there. I you're agree. limiting discussion to left and right. No, that's how we thought way back when. That's why we have such a, so many of the problems today. Whenever I hear either or, it's like, wait a minute, there's other, there's other options. Let's talk about option three, four, five, and six. It's that gets us to, yeah, go ahead. No, I just, it's interesting you say that because right now in light of where we are with this coronavirus, I feel like I'm seeing that on some social media where last night I was like, just what are you scrolling for? I usually don't scroll at all. <laughs> I, I can't, you know, but last night I was, and I'm see, I'm like, why is this person so angry? And some, you know, somebody who was like a, a healer was like all this fear. And then there's some other encampment of fear. And I'm like, why is there an either or here? What, why aren't we just collectively trying to do what's best for ourselves and our communities and, you know, our country and the world on a global scale? Like, why is there either it's like mass hysteria and fear, or it's no, it's not any of that. And people are wrong. And we should, it's like, just you know, it's not that complicated. I don't understand why, I guess the dichotomy makes it easier for people to maybe feel yeah. safe or to feel right, or it, it gives them like a, something to stand on that feels secure. I think that's probably what it is. Yes. And what we've been talking about here today, and, and again, I'm so glad that you're getting this word out, is those, let's just use that for a uh, a shorthand, those more arrows in your quiver is that whenever anyone is trying to corral your thought into either or, I want, uh, I want a little neuron to fire back there somewhere and go, wait, not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing binary argument here. Mm -hmm. And if we're learning anything from these glorious enlightened 21st century is everything is on a spectrum. And yeah. we're also, it's also multivariate. So I often look at things as X and Y axis and sometimes Z axis and go, wait a second. There's when everybody, whenever I'm being corralled into either or decision making, I, I, there's a neuron now that fires and I hold it back at arm's length and look at it and go, what are we not considering here? So mm -hmm. This is what you and I are talking about, about this collaborative nature of being able to talk to somebody and say, look, I've got this whole toolkit here. And so I'm not a Maslow's hammer guy who breaks, you know, the Maslow's old saw, which is really ap apropos to one who works only with a hammer. Everything appears as a nail. And I'm here to say, I'm not looking for nails to beat on here. Uh, I've got all these other tools. Let's look at them. Let's try combining them. And um, I think that offers those, all of us, more options and more customizable approaches. I agree. And uh, I'm curious if you, I know you mentioned the flow state a little while back, and I'd love it if you could break down a little bit. I know you did this in our class, and I think a lot of people are really interested in you know, what is the flow state and how does this ch actually change in our brain? If you could talk a little bit about the alpha and beta states, as well as the, I believe you said the flow state was that delta state. Um, 
Correct me uh, if actually, I'm wrong. Yeah, okay, No, it's I'm okay. It's okay. It's okay. So um, That's why I want actually, you to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So remember we teased out, uh, and I, I got some criticized c criticism from those tours because some people like, same slides over and over again. It was like, yeah, but we kept adding information to them. That mm -hmm. was the idea. It's that titrated approach. That, yeah, it's sort of like, okay, now we're going to add another layer and another layer, and suddenly you're seeing that same slide and going, oh, wow, it's actually, it's deepening. And, it's expanding. and so to the flow state, from what we understand today is, um, so you remember that one slide I teased out, there's the original EEG, which is just a jumble, and then you see all the different frequencies. And we have to uh, realize that all those frequencies are happening at the same, same time. That's why I have that original down there, that big jumble. When you tease them out, you see these different frequencies to understand again my good friend, good doctor, it's multivariate, it's combinatorial, it's integrated. That's the point. So when we look at that jumble, we realize, oh, I see, any one of those frequencies could be the more predominant in that jumble. That being said, you know, when we look at like the alpha state, that's going to be more of that meditative state. Then we mm -hmm. get down into delta and theta, and those are more like we, what we experience when we sleep. Now, when we move up into beta, that's this normal aroused state we're in now, which is often associated with irritated, agitated, and aggravated. Okay. It's not always, but often it is. We, we're, um, we're aware and sometimes maybe even a little hyper aware. In fact, what we often see with the um, ADHD community and ADD community. But if you'll remember then, way above them all was this low amplitude state that is really high frequency. I can't remember 25 to 75 hertz or something crazy sitting up there all by itself. That's the flow state. Now, it's available to you and I in milliseconds and it kind of comes and goes and sometimes we're into it. And of course we don't, we may realize it, we may not, but it's not that easily accessible until we wear a path to its door. So hmm. in the, uh, the way of thinking just earlier this century, until we started really getting into neurofeedback, um, we thought it was the province of the best athletes, the highest uh, artists, the, you know, and musicians. You, you had to, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. You had to put in the 10,000 hours before you um, wore the path to that door. And that makes total sense. Oh, now we're realizing uh, it's actually pretty, I won't say it's easily accessible, but once you taste it, then you realize, oh, golly, I could, I could get to this. I could learn to turn this on and off. And that's mm -hmm. what neurofeedback is doing right now. There's, um, there's an interesting book, and I say the word interesting in quotation marks um, because it's a book called Stealing Fire, and it's written by um, two authors, uh, Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler. And I say... I, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to like this, Alice. <laughs> I, I can I, tell. <laughs> I, I say it, well, I say it in quite quotation marks because there's some, there's some kind of weird California stuff in there that I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, I heard some of that at a lecture I went to the other day. It's about vegan yeah, dogs. Uh, well, yeah, there's also some, well, I'm not going to go into some of the detail, <laughs> but there, there's, well, I'll go into the less race. There's some racy stuff in there. Let me just say there's some racy Californian stuff in there. And um, there's also a lot of stuff in Burning Man, uh, you know, because it talks about the sub chat, the subcategory of the book is uh, stealing fire, how uh, the Navy SEALs, Silicon Valley and maverick scientists are changing the way we work and live. Hmm. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I like 85 percent of the book is excellent there's about 10 to 15 percent but that's just my nature sure. i always kind of find stuff i do you know even andrew weil i love andrew weil but i'm like i'm like 90 percent on board with him there's some stuff where i'm like nah maybe not mm -hmm. 
and I kind of, I think there's always good to have a little healthy skepticism in everything you're looking through. So you just don't become a follower and a believer. Right. And, um, that book uh, talks about neurofeedback and how the Navy SEALs and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project uh, Agency, are using to train SEALs and train submariners. They call it mind gyms now. And they put them on EEG machines with uh, heart rate variability monitors, and they're showing them how to drop out of the beta state into the alpha state. And I believe they're also, they're working on how, in, how to get into the flow state, because this book talks about not only individual flow, Alex, but also group flow. Mm -hmm. And these Navy SEALs fall into this group flow where they don't talk to any, they go on a mission silently because they fall, they call it, they, in the book, we call it flipping the switch. Mm -hmm. And they flip a switch to where they go on their mission and nothing is uttered. If anything is uttered, it's from just their commander. It was depicted well in the, um, at the end of the uh, Tom Hanks movie, Captain Phillips, when they rescued him from the Somali pirates. Those were Navy SEALs and the SEALs didn't utter a word. Hmm. They just completed their mission, packed their stuff up, and left. And so my point being is this stuff is being studied at the highest levels of our defense and our government. Um, this isn't hocus pocus anymore. They realize the heart rate variability monitor, remember uh, in my course I talked about this. When you show increased heart rate variability, and that's not the amplitude, that's the duration between each beat. That is evidence that your parasympathetic nervous system is doing, forgive me, is doing its job. It's actually governing the sympathetic nervous system. It's actually doing its job. So you want to see that. And that along with EEG that's dropping into the alpha state, the meditative state means, my gosh, you're taking control of your vehicle here mm -hmm. and you're setting its pace there's a really good example of a rescue in that, in that book okay. uh, where they go, it's in Afghanistan and they explain how they go in and they, and they do a, an extraction, a rescue without firing a shot. Cause that's the art of it. Hmm. Um, there is also an example in the book uh, with DARPA, how they're using it with submariners to be able to go into group flow because when you're a thousand feet down uh, in a vehicle that could start World War III, you can't have people flipping out. No. You know, you, you've got to have people that can keep everything together and remain calm and do their job in an alpha state versus an irritated, agitated uh, beta state. So flow is something we realize that's hackable now. That's so exciting because, again, what David Dorian did, I think he, I think he read uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's book. It's called Flow. And I only know the pronunciation of his name from hearing Stephen Kotler drop it on interviews mm -hmm. because if you try to look it up, it's all consonants. <laughs> it's, <laughs> you will look at that name and you would go, how do I pronounce that? But it's a famous book. And um, he's a famous researcher. And David Dorian re read that back in, I don't know, the 90s or something. And that's what inspired Taiji Fit, uh, his Miles Davis and martial arts thing is sort of like, wait a minute, putting that flow state at the end of 20 students down to two, that's robbing those other 18 students of this beautiful you know, this beautiful access point. So basically what we've done is inverted the pyramid and go, wait mm -hmm. a minute, this is actually more accessible. And maybe the body is a more um, accessible entry point to that state. I, I think so. I think if we can start to work with the body, sometimes it's better to start there than to not better because there's not really a, I mean, our mind and our bodies go together, but I think when we we can focus on what's happening in our body, especially with um, sensation is what I work with a lot is starting to notice like, you know, what sensations are you noticing? Not what emotion goes with it, not 
what story goes with it, but just what is the physical sensation? And it starts to switch like how we inhabit our bodies. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and that's the point is that um, you and I and others like us have this point of entry. It would be shameful not to introduce this to people. That's the metaphysical therapy concept that I bring to it is that it's like, look, you more arrows in the quiver, more ways of people to try a body approach versus a let's sit down here on a, on this mat and let's try, you know, in a Lotus position and let's try to meditate. Well, you know what, that's that straight direct approach that, is some then you have to use that arduous type of approach whereas let's let's glance alongside it let's kind of go approach it from a a gentler standpoint and we might just find a point a little door that was cracked open and mm-hmm. all we needed to do was walk through it just push gently push our way through it and suddenly you're there and you're gaining the the therapeutic attributes with all with without gladwell's 10,000 hours you know, it's, it's beautiful. And it's nice. Yeah. And I think that's so hopeful for all of us. Like we don't have to put in these multiple years and hours to be able to experience this flow state or to be able to experience just a calmer way of being as we go through our lives. And let me, and let me say to that, thank you for bringing that up because um, it, what we are talking about is hacking this, that we, we there is a more direct access. However, on the other side, for like I say, for a grandmaster like David Dorian Ross, who's got like eight gold medals, national camp competition. He was the first non-Asian to ever win an international medal in Tai Chi, a silver, and he's got a couple of bronzes too. The other side of this coin is giving more people taste to flow state. Some may then decide, ooh, I want to go deeper. Mm-hmm. I, I I really want to practice this formal tai chi beautiful beautiful you know what it's like here great come on and he and he does that he works he still works with those traditional students and teaches them the traditional because this is a martial art it's a deadly martial art but Mm -hmm. you can use it for all these medicinal purposes all these therapeutic purposes but if you really want to learn the you know what he's willing to do that as well that's why it's like again, it's that two-way street. And that's, to me, that's exciting. It's exciting for him. It's exciting for you and me, because we get to um, give people more of these access points. And that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to give them as many therapeutic tools as is under our um, milieu. I love that. And I like that you mentioned and brought up that there is still this training of the tradition, because I think that is equally as important. Um, Agreed. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Matt. We're coming to the end of our time here. Before we hop off, is there any um, any projects that you're currently working on or anything that you want to let people know about? Or where can people find you if they'd like to hear more about the work that you're doing? Thank you. Uh, well, um, actually, I, I revealed to you <laughs> that um, that course that we did together uh, you'll remember I, I described it as a five paragraph theme. I was like, you got an intro, you got an outro. We got the heavy lifting in the middle here, folks. We'll get that done before lunch, et cetera, et cetera. It's, um, it's part of, uh, developing a book and, uh, the book will, you know, the working title is metaphysical therapy to, to get, uh, our colleagues on board. That's part of what that tour around from New York to LA to DC down to Florida. It was, to be able to get feedback from professionals like you. That's why it was so important for me to meet you and uh, those like us, that 10 to 15% out there that come up afterwards and go, oh man, you know, let's talk some more about it. Um, So that's kind of where that's going to be in the works now. It's fantastic. yeah, thank you. It's and and frank and frankly, I'd like to feature, per, you know, between chapters, people like you. So you and I will talk about that. I'd like to interview you and what you're doing, and add that between chapters in the book and say, "Here's Dr. Alice Kirby, and here's what she's doing in Southern California. Here's so and so, and here's what he's doing in New York City." And and because that'll engender our colleagues to go, mm-hmm. "Wow, this is happening." Um, 
Back to contact, uh, I love, well, I have a, a website called Ability On, Dem uh, on Demand, A-B-I-L-I-T-Y, O-N-D-A-M-D-E-M-A, -E and Ability I'll, On Demand. I'll put it in the show notes too, so all the links that you, you that you give me, that's well, hard to spell sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ability On Demand, and it really has a lot to do with my work with industry, because I, again, I'm upstream doing this, you remember some of the stories I told in the class is, I want our colleagues upstream where they can do the most good. I mm -hmm. think we have an amazing skill set, but we're positioned on an old biomedical model that positions us way far down when we're trying to re resolve recalcitrant conditions. That's fine. That's beautiful. But I think the more we can be upstream, the more we can actually prevent those conditions from happening. So abilityondemand.com is a good one. Um, on all the... Um, you know, Instagram and, uh, and uh, Twitter and um, uh, LinkedIn. On Facebook, I would recommend Meta Physical Therapy, the book Meta, Phys I'm sorry, the group Meta Physical Therapy. Because again, we're trying to create community here mm -hmm. and realize we can cross pollinate with one another. I, I learn from you, you learn from me. We, we all benefit from this. So um, I hope that's helpful. And, and thank you for this time to talk. It's, it's, as you can tell, it's thrilling for me to talk to another colleague who gets it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I'm, yeah. sure we'll, I'm sure we'll talk again when the book does get closer. We'll have you back on and, or before that, because I feel like we touched on maybe a, a small number of the subjects I'd like to get into yeah. with you. But, um, yeah, we'll keep doing the amazing work you're doing. I, I follow you, you and I see what you're doing and it, and it thrills me to see the work you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, likewise, thanks. Point.